Uh, next up is uh, Lauren Lanning, the co-founder of Oddworld oh, sorry. Inhabitants. Oh, that's good. That's good. And, uh, and, and currently an animated film director. Ah, well, let's, let's lose that he one. He knows the material so well, he's <laughs> editing it now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> it's burning man delay. We're on playa time. <laughs> okay. I was going to title that, How Burning Man Renewed My Faith in Humanity. <laughs> because the world we live in tends to be like this one, being broadcast to us, being supported by five corporations that control 95% of the media that we're able to have access to. The web's changing that, but they're trying to change that too. And... We live in this landscape that has all of these perceptions that are in many ways manif manifested for us. So Burning Man, the first time I went, was right around the, the uh, beginning of the second Gulf War. And I was living on the central coast of California, which was at that time really beginning to show a lot of its conservative nature and uh, just absurd beliefs. And I had to get out of there, so I moved to Berkeley, and, which is kind of a hotbed for Burning Man, which was really exciting. But going to Burning Man. I'm going to end this with, like, the pitch of if you were pitching Burning Man as, a, as though it were a project or a game. And those of you who pitch things and deal with, you know, rejection all the time like we do, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting to see how something that could have that power, renew my faith in humanity, would be completely counterculture. And so we live in this world that says, you know, this is bad. We're billions of dollars a year on a drug war against this and that. We're teaching our kids this and the other thing. And I thought I'd sort of focus a little bit on the psychedelic aspects of Burning Man today. Not that, I, you know, I'm in his camp. I never, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, these guys, they didn't pay any attention to these rules that were being told because all of these guys are admitted in the psychedelic camp. And our industry is built on the backs of people who experience some of their greatest breakthroughs through relatively psychedelic experiences. And that's really interesting. And then, of course, psychology. Freud brought a completely different perspective. He was a hardcore burner. He would have been out there if he was alive at that time. So was Carl Jung. So was uh, 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 with the uh, uh, cosmos and bringing science to the public and quantum mechanics with Carl Sagan, who was the, after he died, the admitted Mr. X secret writer for High Times throughout a lot of his career. Then we have Andrew Weiss, who's a... Uh, uh, reinterpreting how we understand modern healing. And then, of course, one of my personal favorites, Roger Waters, who changed a lot of how we listen to music. And, uh, you know, other sort of psychedelic believers at the time it was like Black Elk, one of my big heroes of all time, except in his culture, it was like, but of course, you know, of course, psychedelic experience. How would we be connected to the earth if it were not for that? These other guys were all doing it illegally. <laughs> Now, this guy, I don't know for a fact that he was uh, using anything of the nature, but come on, man. You know? I mean, <laughs> we know what was going on around here. <laughs> and, of course, you know, there's a lot of reason because the one, part of the reason it renewed my faith in people was because being out in the desert where there's no food or water and ants don't even live, it's so desolate, uh, and seeing how everyone can get along is, uh, you know, and if you really take an in-depth look at the history of our nation, of our world, we see how dangerous that is. You know, because then, like the 60s, we had a lot of thinking, a lot of progressive movement happening. The media was actually covering news and not manufacturing it for us. And it was a different landscape, and that became a big threat to a lot of powers that be. And these guys, you know, didn't like that at all. So they would tell us all the time and would always promote that, you know, these types of experiences are just bad for your children and bad for our culture and, you know, bad for the family values and all this. So the people that run Burning Man found the place where they wouldn't get bothered by that shit. So they went to a Black Rock Indian reservation and there's no federal law. And that's why this experience could happen there. Because unless it was on private property or dictated by normal experiences, uh, uh, normal boundaries of our society, it wouldn't be allowed. But the Indians, well, they were given, you know, the most desolate pieces of land that no one else could figure out what to do with. But in doing so, they were able to have their own laws there. And therefore, people like this would attend, get covered with dust, go camping, and have a place where I found what I believed was game of the year for 2005. And that was dance, dance, immolation. And that was just 
awesome. And this was a, a game where you had to put on a fire retardant suit, sign a legal document that basically said if you die, it's not their fault. And this game had some real fucking consequences, man. Not like this, <laughs> this <laughs> you know. Not this pussy shit that we dish out and we're, we think we're badasses because we blow everyone in, away in quake. No, man. This is like, put your money where your mouth is, get up on a stage, and let's see how well you do some dance dance on this tune. And so this was about dance dance pads uh, laid out and on a big screen, and spectators got to watch, and it was really, and, and if you did the correct moves, you got like a fabulous light show of flamethrowers, and you know, the more it compounded, the more cool it got, and it's loud, and it's, uh, you know, Real crowd pleaser. Of course, if you fail, you know, these flamethrowers just in, engulf you completely, you know. So you're just toast, right? <laughs> and uh, it gets really hot in there, you know. So it reminded me of an old, like, I Spy movie. I was thinking the, uh, the line to play Dance Dance Revolution was hours long. People would wait in line for hours. If it were here... No doubt. I mean, there would be the biggest line for any game well, to be, be played. It would be here. The line would be lawyers. Yeah, <laughs> with cards in hand, and it's fun too because in two-player mode you could really stick it to the other guy, you know. But now you really are. You know? <laughs> and that is hot. And so that brings me to the trying to do this shortly. Like you know, if we were to pitch Burning Man from sort of just an uh, experiential perspective and not really understanding the inside business model. And going to the bank and you know saying, well, here's the concept. You know, what we're going to do is going to get about forty to fifty thousand counterculture experience, you know, type of people. And uh, there's only camping. And by the way, there's no lakes, rivers, woods, or wildlife. And there's none of that shit. There's some stargazing, you know, but nothing else. And uh, think like theme park for homeless people. <laughs> kind of. And what's the demographic? You know, you can just see sitting in the publisher's office, right? Eh, demographic. It's like drug, art, music culture. You know? Really uh, psychedelic, uh, I mean, a lot of aging hippies and social anarchists. Yeah. How about the location? Well, we're going to find the most hostile, bearing, dry, remote area that we can find that not even, and I kid you not, ants don't even live there. Right. It's a dry lake bed. It's, yeah, of talc. <laughs> Gypsum, yeah. yeah. So there's no bugs, you know, it's kind of yeah, great. The stuff they use in sheetrock walls, this is where they get it from. Really? <laughs> yeah. And it's an hour, hour's drive from anywhere, and there's no public transportation. And the duration, we're going to go eight, eight days, 24 hours a day. And with that, of course, we'll have several hundred thousand watt sound systems that are running 24 hours a day for the, virtually the entire time. Merchandising, zip, none, none of that shit, no corporate logos, nothing's for sale, uh, no food, no water, no alcohol, and bring your own booze, and hopefully not. Leave the booze at home, except coffee and ice, you know. I think caffeine is something that they... Civilization. It's, yeah, it's, it's inseparable. And then the cost, well, it's going to be millions of dollars, and we're going to give away a lot of that to just cool art projects that have no means of returning revenue and just experiential for the crowd of people that are going to go. And you go, well, <laughs> how much are you going to charge for this? About 200 bucks per person, and, you know, clothing's optional, but if you need to wear something, sort of something on a lunatic fringe would be preferable, you know, uh, something relatively insane. And... As a business model, it's just nuts. And as I would walk around Burning Man, and each year I would go, I'd just look at this and go, this is impossible. This absolutely should not work. This is a recipe for total chaos, riots. They'd, if it was on a public space, there would be National Guard there ready to you know, put out things. There's barely any security. And yet, it's one of the most rejuvenating sort of like, wow, how can people get along in a, where, in a world that we don't live in and see it happen and see them help each other, see them, you know, come supplied. 50,000 people with only porta potties and no water for sale when it's over 100 degrees every day. It just makes no sense. And yet, what it's amounted to is about the coolest experience to be found on planet Earth today. And a lot of the people that attend this regularly would agree, wholeheartedly. People come from all over the world. So I leave that with a, a quote from uh, one of my favorite people, Einstein, which is, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent, but it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And I don't know about Einstein, but he had to. You know, he, he had to. <laughs> And that leaves me with the new dare, which is dare to defy market statistics, resist popular trends, express yourself, and put passion and heart into everything you do, especially this medium that reaches so many mind, minds, and we're not putting enough of our, of our deeper thinking into it right now. Games have the possibility to be much more than just a, uh, a Twitch 
and uh, community experience. They can be an enlightening experience as well. Thank you. Just, it, one, one of the things that struck me right away is uh, the generosity of how much people have invested in terms of time, energy, and even their own money to create free experiences for other people. I mean, it, it's, we, we don't live on that landscape for the most part. In the, in the business community, we don't at all. Uh, unless there's an agenda, unless it's a, you know, a hook to draw your eyeballs in for some other sale down the line. But when you see, when it's hard to be an asshole when that really stands out. See, in our culture, we're taught that everyone's trying to tell us something, sell us something, and what we are is we're intelligent if we're skeptical. You know, so we go, well, what are you trying to sell me now? And then we, we have this sort of hyper, hypercritical look of everything around us. And then we go to Burning Man, and it's like, these people aren't making any money in what they're doing. They're just creating this experience for you. So it's hard to step into that landscape and not get, not get rained on right away because you know that that sort of perceptive state of skepticism, it's really not wanted there. And the vibrations of that feel it because it's very open. And when you sense that someone did all this, it's like going to, you know, someone's house for dinner and there's a major spread and you didn't have to pay a dime to get there, you know. You're a little more respectful of what's going on. And as soon as you enter, I mean, right coming through the gates and naked people come up and start hugging you, you get a sense that you're in a very different, <laughs> you know, landscape. You met naked Bruce, did you? And, and they say, welcome home. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so likely it's, it's going to be community finance or individually financed to show just like YouTube or just like MySpace, you know, it's going to start like again in, you know, in a, a, for lack of a better description, a garage that doesn't have the, uh, the skepticism, the professional skepticism swarming around it like you do in corporate culture that can allow something to break through and show that historic trends are not the projection of what can be. I have an opinion on that, which is that a lot of what makes Burning Man work, I think, is a feeling of anonymity, that, that we don't have a role that we have to prescribe to. And, in fact, if we're fulfilling our normal role, we're feeling rather out of place. And, it's, and, and the culture is creating a safe feeling for that. You know, our world outside of BlackRock is, is the opposite idea. You know, we, have to, we, we do better if we fit in these categories and we behave in certain ways. So that anon anonymity is there, but we also have witnessing. You know, and that's what needs to uh, get more and more into the MMO world as well, is that when someone is, uh, and you know, it's taking place to different degrees, but where the community can, can witness some, an avatar, and that avatar basically starts gathering a lot of bad karma. You know, or and, I would say one of the things we have to do is have it be user sponsored. You know, I mean, that's what made MySpace really interesting for the demographic, which was largely young people that want to express themselves and meet other young people who live in an impersonal world. Right? So that gave them an opportunity to, to start, you know, expressing outward. Uh, of course, that's turning into statistical data for News Corp. <laughs> you know, which is really, you know, the acquisition play. But so now you're gathering all those people who just, you know, had faith to put all their information there is now being, you know, racked up by one of the biggest, you know, threats to our world, in my opinion. But um, <laughs> so, so if the community is sponsoring it and governing it, you know, uh, it's like Colin Powell said, democracies are really hard to, to do deals with, you know, because everyone has an opinion. And it's just much easier if it's a dictatorship, which is really what a corporation is at, at its core. You know, it doesn't have a de democratic process. And so when the community is having that influence, then it has the, the, the chance to sustain momentum. So if it needs funding, you have organizations like MoveOn.org. You know, th they're not really funded. They're funded by the community. So all of a sudden, the community's values transcend as it starts becoming an economic force. And I think that's key.